the beginning of the end for the bloody slums. The final countdown now in progress. Bulldozers, sledgehammers, wire ropes, pulverizing and cutting their way through an era of bad housing and near serfdom. The present tragic and complex situation stems from the original concept behind the building of these houses. The force motive was a large number of low-cost dwellings built quickly and within easy reach of nearby employment. They were therefore designed for bare utility. Each one allotted the minimum of breathing space and carrying the stigma of the era during which they were built. Cleanliness may have been quoted as next to godliness, but nevertheless the gap between them was a wide one. Hence the absence of a bath and hot running water. And as for the unfortunate inhabitants, here God could be allowed to fit into the scheme of things by divinely ensuring that a reasonable number survived. The human authorities at first were not unduly interested. These bleak and unlovely so-called homes will not be missed. A closer view only magnifies their ugliness. The vast majority have outlived their time, and at best only short-term repairs are in order. Here is a classic example where the subsidizing of a rented house at the expense of a landlord will condemn it quicker than dry rot and now the price is being paid. High priority is being given to the removal of these indignities but the problems are considerable not the least being the time lag the period leading up to demolition and the rehousing of the occupants and during this phase they must remain under substandard conditions as the area further declines from its original working class status into a slum. In 1970, it was stated that there were in England and Wales nearly two million unfit houses, half of which would have to be demolished in slum clearance areas and the rest individually. In addition, four and a half million dwellings, though not unfit, required urgent repairs or lacked some basic amenity. In determining whether a house is unfit for human habitation, the Housing Acts maintain that regard should be paid to its state in respect of certain faults in repair, stability, freedom from damp, internal arrangement, natural light, ventilation, water supply, drainage and sanitary conveniences, facilities for the preparation and cooking of food, and the disposal of waste water. Furthermore, the house should be so far unfit in one or more of these items as to make it unsuitable for occupation in that condition. And in this respect, there are very few houses round here that would not be found wanting. A typical unfit house, perished open jointed brickwork whose rotted woodwork is supported by an equally rotted sill, the sandstone corroded by years of acid from the atmospheric pollution which has blanketed the area. A dirty bottle holding up a rotted window frame in place of the missing sash cord. And at ground level, no damp proof course, which means inevitably that in our climate there will be permanent rising and penetrating dampness to afflict the walls of the lower rooms, making decorating a waste of time and money. Leaking roofs from disarranged slates then sag as the tired timbers gradually give way under the weight, often pushing outwards, even on a window, with the top courses of brickwork, until this is what happens. Walls, too, can indicate imminent danger of collapse, and subsiding foundations will distort any exterior. Here, the broken stack results from brick and mortar decay, common enough internally, but serious at this stage. The majority of housing complaints received by the health department concerns water and its effects. From a leaking gutter that nobody can be bothered to repair, the water will spread down the wall, washing out the mortar from the brickwork and causing severe penetrating dampness. And added to all these structural problems, often goes the lack of everyone's birthright, natural light. Here is a prime example of overshadowing because the houses were built too close together. Daylight hardly penetrates to the rear rooms, and it is often necessary to keep the electric light on all day. The scullery and kitchen, where the housewife spends most of her time, are the worst affected. 
but these are tangible items, and the main overriding want is an intangible one. The truth is that today people ask for more than a place in which to be born, eat, sleep and die. The Hanging Garden of Salford only emphasises the lack of open space and green grass. There is a miasma of decay here, applicable to more than the buildings. The occupants, in chameleon-like manner, taking on themselves the erosion of the surroundings. A state of limbo, when the present is not permanent and the future only an unguaranteed promise. The children play in dirt and filth and are happy because they know no better. I've seen a lot of changes in Salford and to my opinion from it being when it was a borough it is now absolutely slums now it's a city I know Salford from going back it was a palace when it was a borough people used to go outside and clean their front everybody did it was a treat to just look down the street and see how nice it was as I've repeated you better get in now you'll better get out and that's what I think about them today. And also I can see myself going about that they neither look after the roads, the pavements, nor nothing. And I'd like any of the corporation of the high officials to come along and push a wheelchair in Salford in these streets. And the health wants to go around a bit more and have a look at some other places. It's, that back end is a disgrace. If you were to go outside in that entry, it would open your eyes. They filled me. I don't know whether it's because it's going to be made slums and they'll not, but it's been going on for years, deteriorating. There's many moments I want to scream when I look at like this. And I go in and look at my father in law as a lovely masonette and it knocks you sit when you come home and look at this one. You're fighting round to get into the kitchen. If there's more than one in, you've, you've had it. And the children are shouting, coming in and murdering you. And you've just no room. Well, you've no hot water, you've no bath. You've got to drag a bath in to bath them. And the walls are falling, all the plaster's falling. And you... You can't have lights because all the wiring's faulty and... Uh, there's drafts from all over and... I know, all they're very depressing, you're overcrowded and... They're horrible. When I got married, I admit I was glad of the house because we hadn't got a house. But I never thought I'd be... I'd have to live in it this long. I always thought we'd have been able to get something decent. My husband feels the same way as I do. I've put a few rounds over the house. Bound to do because it gets me down and I have to take it out of him then, you see. And I'm arguing with him over it then. And he always says, what can he do? Well, Andy, there's nothing he can do and they won't help you, so... We have to just put up with it. One of these days we'll be waking up and it'll be on top of us. And then they'll perhaps move us then. Inside, these grim and dreary houses, deprived even further of light, are worse than outside. The remnants of a roof giving little protection from the weather. The solitary tub, hopefully intended to catch the rain, seems singularly ineffective when compared with the huge gap above it. And where there is no apparent hole, the damp has permeated the ceiling and walls, the paper barely clinging to the wet surfaces. The shabby coverings on the ramshackle apology of a bed are urine-soaked, forming one long continuous wet line with the leaking wall. Here, conditions have been reduced by circumstances to almost primitive levels and yet there can be no valid criticism. The difficulties of living under these conditions must be understood. 
These houses are in such a bad state of repair that any effort by occupants or owner would show little result. Housing problems today are an end product of Great Britain's intense industrialization, mainly during the last century. The working man was the tool used for this purpose, and on his back Great Britain became truly great. This would have been fair if the worker had reaped a share of the benefits at that time. On the contrary, his accommodation in the newly developed areas was rushed. Substandard houses, in type if not in construction, were often built back to back with no passage between them. Sanitary arrangements were crude and treated as unimportant by the planners. Disease was the fatal consequence of these conditions and because contagious sickness knew no class distinction it was a medical problem, the dreaded cholera and not a housing one which first aroused public concern. Edwin Chadwick, born in Manchester, was the great sanitary reformer whose incessant efforts led in 1848 the first Public Health Act, which created medical officers of health and inspectors, and it was they who demonstrated that squalid living conditions, impure water, inadequate drainage, damp and overcrowding presented the greatest danger to the country's health. From then on a succession of acts dealing with housing and health were passed, culminating after a century in the Major Act of 1957. But the earlier legislation had little effect. Slum houses with hardly any improvement continued to go up, and so many that were built 80 to 100 years ago still stand as a shabby monument to social injustice. This house not far away is the same as the others in the street, in construction that is, bricks, mortar and the 101 other materials that go into building, but there all comparison ends. This is a home, cared for and tended lovingly, and it requires another glance outside to remember where it stands. Children can grow up well in this house if they shrug off the effects of the environment outside, and the effort is to some extent recognized, for on demolition the occupants will be awarded a payment for good maintenance. And reason suggests that wherever these people go, they will take with them their cleanliness and tidiness. Unfortunately, the opposite can be true. Where there is dirt and neglect, the habits die hard. This is not normal refuse, but selfish collective dumping, reflective of the desperate don't care attitude of the remaining inhabitants in using the nearest available empty backyard as a local public rubbish dump. It soon becomes a health hazard until finally the corporation is forced to clean up this unwholesome mess. The problem has become so acute that only a token gesture here and there can be made. Seemingly, the individual inhabitants of an area under demolition are concerned only with themselves or near family. They ignore the broader outline of a problem in which they can do so much to help by cooperating. But as power corrupts, so do squalor and poverty degrade and actions that would normally be classed as antisocial must be viewed in their proper perspective against the background of events and conditions that prompt them. The last Salford Medical Officer of Health stated publicly that fewer Salford children survive the first year than elsewhere. The infantile death rate has at times been twice the national average. But while this backwash of the Industrial Revolution still plagues us, now at last the voices of protest are being heard. And in keeping with the principle that even the most momentous of occasions could have a simple start, events begin with a notice on a wall. Whereas the Council of the City of Salford submitted to the Minister of Housing and Local Government for confirmation the above-named order, which would authorise them to acquire compulsorily for the purposes of Part 3 of the Housing Act, 1957, relating to clearance areas, the land included in the order, and the first step down a long road has been taken. The inquiry that follows, on this occasion dealing with Salford's North George Street clearance area, is a public one. A democratic safety valve, the opportunity for the public to state its case. It is an impartial hearing conducted in a semi-legal atmosphere. 
the Ministry's inspector presiding calmly and patiently over the lengthy proceedings. Councils plead their clients' briefs, cheek by jowl with a harassed housewife, and there is no priority. The legal arguments flow backwards and forwards, a point offered, discussed, and then accepted or rejected. The majority of differences are over the magic word, compensation. And in this manner, peculiar to our Anglo-Saxon nation, the fate of an area and the future of a large number of citizens is dealt with in an almost hushed atmosphere. Yet there is often bitterness and deep frustration here, and these feelings are aimed at the nearest available target, the local corporation, even though it is clear that much of the responsibility for removing these shocking conditions must be borne nationally. Meanwhile, the authorities in Salford are still being abused for events beyond their control and out of their time. The inquiry is now closed. The Minister's Inspector, accompanied by a local public health official, will visit every house that was subject to an objection. He will check the claims made by the City Council that the property is in bad order, and also any opposing claims to the contrary made by the owner or occupier. Months later, the decision will be given. If the compulsory purchase order is confirmed, the next step is the delivery by hand of notice of entry upon the occupier, stating that the Council will officially take over the property within 14 days. And then the complicated, massive machinery of local government will swing into action. The main item will, of course, be rehousing, and every home will be visited to ascertain the needs of an individual or family. Then there are the emergency repairs and maintenance, the removal of unwanted furniture and effects, disinfestation of house, furniture and family possessions, and finally, the demolition. Complete rehousing of an area normally takes at least 18 months, but there are problems which in turn create other problems. Each snag snarling up a bottleneck, delay feeding upon delay with mathematical progression, until in the end the actual deed often lags wearily behind its original conception. This North George Street area was doomed to demolition in December 1967. It was a slow death. It took three years, and this was only one small area of Salford, only one stage, one piece of a complicated jigsaw. But now demolition and rehousing move out of the realm of statistics. Here the occupants are no longer names and numbers on an order. The celebration is mingled with heartbreak, sadness and nostalgia in the farewell party for the street. For it is symbolic that the festivities conducted in the shadows of the grim architectural monstrosities are for the children. In a recent poll, over 44% of the adult community wanted to stay in the area particularly the older inhabitants living on their own. The brutal truth is that they are all frightened of change, and with some reason. Though it is an accepted fact that the new housing conditions are beyond comparison with the old, there is one sad loss, the sense of communal life so strong in these slum areas, and all the fine buildings in the world may not bring this back. But here the party was premature. The street lived for another year. Elsewhere there is no waiting. The final procedures of demolition and rehousing go steadily on. The years of planning, discussion and problems now culminate at this one point. The moving of possessions from the old to the new. For many, it opens up a new world the opportunity to enjoy life in better surroundings and under vastly improved conditions. But then, with awful suddenness, the house is empty and ready for its preordained end. In the wake of recent departure comes a flurry of activity, the severing of the lifelines, the utilities, electricity, gas and water, the appendages that once supplied warmth, light and power 
to transform the brick walls into a home. These are almost the last rites. Even what remains has a value, and the modern scavengers and the demolition squad chosen by tender move in and prepare to pick clean the shell. Timber, metal and piping are salvaged. Nothing is wasted. The bricks as rubble are destined for the beds of the new motorway. Roof slates are collected by this ingenious man-made rude conveyor belt system. Better materials are chosen for future property repairs. And thus, small pieces of a dying house will eventually help to prop up other old and weary houses until they, in turn, too, are demolished. And their pieces move on further in a minor form, a widening ring of self-perpetuation. Then, at last, with everything removed, the house is dead. Now demolition in this area is almost complete, but elsewhere it has just begun. It doesn't take very long to pull down these old houses. With their destruction go the myriad complaints and festering sores of a slum. With them vanishes overcrowding, lack of sun and fresh air, and the unhealthy living conditions. But, I do warn you that during the processes of demolition, conditions develop which are appalling. We know this, we sympathise with it, we know that it could be cured if we could spend an unlimited amount of money on it, but it would literally take that to do it the way we want it doing. 
and I was thinking of the start. Oh my god! <gasps> I could go mad! I really could! The grimy everybody potty! To mean to say yeah, all this noise and the dirt! The oh you can't live with the dirt! Are you getting some fresh air then? Fresh air round here? Hey? Fresh air, he'll bloody kill you around here, that's what he's trying to do. Look at this, when you come down here, it's like a bloody sandstorm, like, like the western desert. But they couldn't have made a bloody worse job of it if they'd have put bloody kids on it. I wouldn't have them, I'd, if I was corporation, I'd fire that contractor off this job. Be like, we're living like pigs that's left here. And then you get the odd men coming, taking fireplaces out, you don't know who's going to be in next door. You'll be sat there and near it. told me they was, uh, these would be up six years. Six years and I've not been in two years and they're coming down. They tell you anything till they get you. They're putting you in condemned air. This is about a couple of years. And then you've got to go again. And yeah. it's not on when you're getting on in your, your age. You don't want to be mucking about here and go splitting here and splitting there. We're living in condition, but if we read about it, in another foreign country we'd be saying the dirty bookers, wouldn't we? It's a ghost town, full of remembrances, and not all of them bad. A halfway house from nowhere to somewhere, and often the waiting and anticipation cause torment. A transference from old to new, and many of the passengers making the journey are uneasy riders. For the weapons of demolition are but the tools of progress, leaving behind nothing but old memories, until finally a bare desolation from which will eventually rise the new buildings of gleaming glass, concrete, brick and steel, framed by swathes of green grass and open playgrounds. And a page of history will have been turned, an epoch come to an end. Meanwhile, the few remaining houses stand derelict and empty, shorn of life and contents, until the ultimate indignity. I was born in Cavendish Street. I'd be about nine when Queen Victoria died. I had nine children. I'd have waited 21 years. And the air was I remember salt was like that. I used to do my own decorating. When the horse was on I used to whitewash me yard. Always like that. They used to come along Regent Road. I've never had a great lot of pleasure. I used to go without the I still have thought about my kids and me all. On a Sunday absolutely. evening, as far as Trafford Park, which was a park in those days with no yeah, works on it, and they used to collect we were happy and clean. And buttercups. It wasn't no. modern like they are today because we couldn't afford it, but we were clean. There used to be so fanatical about cleaning. But that's where I was born. They cleaned the doorsteps. Never with a mop because that was lazy. On and the hands of the awesome Right down to the curb. Nobody dare walk down that street for two days because it was clean. Been in 60 years. No, it's a long while since it's been in house. And I've been happy. Your neighbours? 
I think your neighbours uh, was a, at one time was the best advantage in the world. Intelligent. You could go out, your neighbours say, "Oh, what's your kids yeah, playing?" Some good games and play rugby. You know, you don't see the kids playing them these days. Holidays. And we used, we used to play in the yeah. streets, but the old people used to go over your back door. You don't see none of them games. So I'd go and brew up and bring a drink, you know, and I'd be fantastic. I mean, Salford's always been cold, hasn't it? Always been cold. Always been cold. But people who's lived in it. I mean, best past them, I think, don't want to buy something. They still want to be something.